Okay, uh, as far as our lineup this evening, uh, we're really looking forward to a presentation by David Bollinger. Uh, he is the author of this bill, SB 76, for school property tax elimination. And uh, he has probably done more uh, for you and I and property tax reform than anyone that I can think of, uh, especially anyone in this room tonight. Um, we, are, we do have a little bit of change in our uh, in agenda, and I've been asked that, um, I'm sorry, what's your name again, sir? Jerry Sohorchek. Jerry Sohorchek uh, would like a few minutes. I understand that he is the former Secretary of Education under Ed Rendell, is that correct, sir? And uh, we would like to give him five minutes and let him share his thoughts on the matter. Will you please welcome yeah. I appreciate uh, uh, being here with all of you, and I join you, and I know uh, Senator Wozniak, I join him in his fight for uh, controlling the amount of money that property taxpayers have to pay. Senator Wozniak has been involved in, uh, uh, the, especially the Westmont School District, but all of the school districts, in trying to support them in the funny formula that we have now uh, as a Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, one that just doesn't work. Uh, I want to talk to you about that just a bit. Uh, our funding formula for Pennsylvania, we, we spend probably over $30 billion a year. That's to educate 1.8 million students. That's a lot of kids across 500 school districts. That 500 number is growing because of charter and cyber charter schools too. So we spend a lot of money. However, the state uh, doesn't really spend their fair share. They spend about 32%. That means 68% of those $30 billion plus dollars come from property taxes. One push that we have is, is to get an adequate amount of funding established for, uh, for the state to pay. Now there's two problems with adequacy. One is it costs a heck of a lot more money to educate a child in poverty or a child that has English as a second language than it does to a, to a middle income child who is not uh, uh, struggling with the English language. So it costs different in different school districts. In 2007, we did an adequacy study in Pennsylvania. We didn't do it. Uh, the state legislature, Republican Senate and the House, sponsored a study done by a group from Colorado that was called the Ockenblick, probably the best group in the country to do this type of study. They did all the methodologies on what would it really take one district versus the other. In all total, they found out that the state at the time was spending $4 billion, or they should have been spending $4 billion more than they were. That was in 2007. So that number obviously has grown with rising health care, rising retirement, and cost to um, educate young children. That number is growing. Our, our disadvantage would be not to educate young children. If we think education is... Uh, uh, a problem, uh, we're on the wrong side of, of right. Education is probably the elixir for things like uh, using the healthcare system unfairly, going into the emergency room too often, or getting incarcerated, or not being productive as a productive citizen, not paying your fair share of the way uh, as we go through personal income, etc. So when a kid doesn't get educated very well, uh, the drag on the economy is greater than the property tax drag. I joined John in saying, look, I, I'm all for the concept of how do we beat back relying on the property taxes too much and make this unevenness about property taxes straighten out. We have to figure that out. And that's going to take a lot of work. And we've been, honestly, a lot of people have been working hard at that. But we also have to consider we need public education. We need education in our Commonwealth. We got a couple million kids uh, coming out of our schools every decade that go into 30 and 40 years of their work life uh, either productive or a drag. And a drag in incarceration is about a thirty to fifty thousand dollar a year drag. So, being for a kid from Reading City or York City or Erie City or Pittsburgh City or any of the Rust Belt cities or the impoverished cities or any town is the right thing to be. So we have to get the funds from somewhere. The idea of eliminating property tax might be a good idea, but the property tax proposal, with, with all due respect, is, is not thought out enough. I think when you're four billion dollars short, and you're just talking about replacing current money, maybe replacing current money, with sales and personal income tax, 
I think the unpredictability of that is going to be very, very tough. So I would stand for the idea that this is a good topic, study it, get more and more involved, but not so fast, because you might have a consequence that's uh, inconsiderate of the true outcomes you want for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So I'm, I'm here for learning more, staying open-minded. I hope everybody in the room would join me in that open-mindedness. I can tell you I would study the costing out study. I would study the true cost of education in Pennsylvania. What you think reasonably is the trajectory of those costs going out 10 years or 20 years, uh, and how we can ease the burden on the property taxpayers in the greater Johnstown community or throughout the Commonwealth. In Johnstown, we've done a lot to do that, but a lot of it is hard work inside the districts. It's the second part of the equation is what are you doing to raise revenue and watch expenditures inside your school districts. We're, we're doing a lot. A lot of schools are trying to do a lot. But walking away from the education system isn't an answer for the, for the Commonwealth or anybody at, at any level. So thanks very much for having me. Uh, God bless all of you. I, I want to continue to work with you and for you. I'm retiring uh, from my job in just a year and looking forward to uh, getting on the other side of this. I do own property in Johnstown, and I own property in Eastern Pennsylvania, too. I'm paying property taxes, and I don't like it any more than you do. But I also have to understand that uh, uh, we, need to, we need to fund our systems. Senator, thanks for your good work. Uh, sometimes it's magical. i got to tell you just one quick story. John was trying to propose something in the uh, formula that I told him impossible. Uh, two months later, he's standing behind the governor signing a bill, and what he was proposing got Westmont, I think, about $500,000. Uh, extra in their revenue system. So I appreciate that very much uh, that you were able to do that. It's good to have seniority. Thanks. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. Okay, we appreciate the input uh, from Jerry, and uh, we're going to move right along with uh, David Bollinger, uh, once again, the author of the bill uh, 76, property tax, school property tax elimination. And uh, the man has the numbers right on, and I think you'll understand when he's finished why we all need to support this bill. So, thank you very much. With that, David Bollinger. Why so quiet? <laughs> with all due respect to the secretary, I'm sorry. I, I generally don't start off being argumentative. But I have one thing to say. We've studied this issue for 30 years. That's we don't right. have time to study it anymore. And that's not the way I like to start, but I just had to get that comment in there. Um, as Dean said, my name is David Baldinger, and I'm here tonight representing the Pennsylvania Coalition of Taxpayer Associations. We are 84 nonpartisan grassroots taxpayer groups from across the Commonwealth who are working for one goal, and that is the elimination of school property taxes through House Bill and Senate Bill 76. I'm going to start you off tonight with a few numbers. Secretary's numbers and mine vary a little bit close enough. Anybody have any idea what we're looking at here? $27 billion, with all due respect, Senator, $30, million, $30 billion, is the current total cost of K-12 education in Pennsylvania. The average annual rate of increase, historically, is six and a quarter percent. Far greater than the rate of inflation, far greater than the increase in the average weekly wage. If you take that number as a constant, multiply it for 10 years, you'll find the total cost of education in Pennsylvania is going to, going to increase to $53 billion. We've got to get a handle on this now. There's another number for you. That is what you can see your school property taxes go up in the next two to three years, mostly because of the pension spike, but that's what the actuaries are predicting, a 30% increase in your property taxes. How many of you can sustain that kind of an increase? I've heard folks all over the state tell me they're having difficulties right now dealing with the property tax. 30% more is just going to drive more people out of their homes. One final number. I'll give you a clue about that. Uh, this newspaper is from Berks County. See what it says at the top? These are not foreclosures. These are sales because of unpaid property taxes. There's over 1,200 of, 1200 of them in here. Here's the same thing from Luzerne County. 
from Dauphin County. We've seen it all over the state. 10,000 is the number of homes estimated to be sold for property tax share of sales in Pennsylvania every year. And that doesn't include those folks who sell, sometimes at a loss, because they can't, they're, they're afraid they're going to have their home sheriffed. And it doesn't include foreclosures. Now I've had those who tell me that people who are foreclosed, maybe they bought too much house and, well, they can't afford it. Well, okay, maybe that's true, maybe it's not, but the fact is, when a home is foreclosed, it hurts the neighborhood where it's located, it hurts the local economy, and the bill we're going to talk about tonight is going to help with foreclosure numbers. And give me an idea where we stand right now. Cambria County, right now, has 794 homes in one step of foreclosure from another, from pre-foreclosure to actually kicking people out of their house. Your neighbors in Indiana County, just over 1,000. Blair County, 1,800. Clearfield, 1,000. And Cambria's number of 794 is a 33% increase from April of last year just impending foreclosures. You think it's a property tax problem, and that's really only a symptom of the problem. The problem is a broken education finance system. So I'm going to start you off with this tonight. I think you can't understand the solution if you don't understand the problem. And I want to talk a little bit about the problem first. There's myth number one. Property taxes are the problem. They are not. The real problems. First of all, it's an antiquated taxation system that dates back to the Middle Ages. At that time, the only ones who owned land were the wealthy people. The serfs didn't own anything, and they were the ones who were taxed to support their government. We imported this into Pennsylvania in the early 1800s, and at that time, it probably made sense, because we were basically an agrarian society. You could assume a farmer who was farming 40 acres was earning more than a farmer who was farming 10 acres. And it made sense to tax them on the value of the land, but we continue that today. Our homes don't earn any income for us. We don't earn money with our homes, so why are we taxed as if they do? But the worst part of it is, one of the prime precepts of good taxation is that the tax should meet the ability of a person to pay it. The school property tax in no way meets that criteria, especially with seniors who are retired, on a fixed income, have worked all their lives to pay for their homes, and suddenly they're left with the equivalent of a mortgage every year in school property taxes. Property taxes are inherently arbitrary and unfair. The appraisal system, the assessment system in Pennsylvania is absolutely broken. And in fact, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court ruled in that a few years ago that it doesn't work. We don't reassess often enough, but even when we do, you have an assessor who will look at two different homes and say, this one's worth $200,000, this one's worth $150,000. Totally subjective. How can you say that? And in fact, to give the example of our home in Berks County, we live in a cookie cutter development. It was built around 1984. All the homes were about the same square footage. All the lot sizes were about the same. Berks County last reassessed in 1987. And somehow in that assessment, our home came up being valued $20,000 more than the home that was practically identical right next door. Now, we appealed it, and we had a few thousand dollars knocked off, but that's not the point. How fair is the system when you can have that sort of, that sort of disparity between the values of two houses sitting side by side? How is that fair in any way at all? The inability to pay property tax bills. Our tax collector is very friendly toward the idea of what we're trying to accomplish. And every year I pay my taxes on the very last day of the rebate period so I can have a chat with her and she tells me what has been going on. This year she said more folks than ever are asking for the payment plan. She's had more defaults this year than she's seen before. There are those who have complained that they have either taken out home equity loans or reverse mortgages to be able to afford the taxes. If this continues, more and more folks are going to lose their homes, and she's seeing this increase every year in the number of people who are having difficulty. Out of control spending. I'm not one who likes to bash school boards. I think for the most part, it's a thankless job. And a lot of school boards work very hard, but we have also seen the opposite. Those first of all, and, and this again, I'm going to refer to Berks County because I'm most familiar with it. Every year our local newspaper, when, when school board elections are up, runs a little bio on each of the candidates. And I'm always struck by how someone running for school board in one district is the spouse of a teacher or an administrator in another district. Or how they're a retired administrator. 
or a retired teacher or someone with a vested interest in that school board. But even worse are the helicopter parents, the ones who want to be elected to a school board so they can get what they want for their children. Again, I'm going to refer back to Berks County and our particular school district. We had one member of the school board who insisted that the school start offering ballet lessons because her daughter wanted to learn ballet on our dime. I'm sorry, that's wrong, and that's part of the spending problem, along with college-level stadiums. I know other sports fans in here, but do we really need that? Lack of effective education cost controls. Act 1 was supposed to um, mitigate some of that by not allowing school districts to raise taxes more than a maximum indicated each year by the Department of Education. I believe this year it was 2.7%. However, there are three loopholes. School districts can ask for exceptions to the referendum. It's the grandfather debt and pensions and third one slips in mind. But they have three, three exceptions they can use. Apply to the Department of Education and say, we're going to use this exception this year. We want to raise taxes higher than the limit. And the Department of Education rubber stamps it. Out of 500 school districts in Pennsylvania, 160 this year applied for exceptions to referendum and they were granted. Highest property tax increase among those, those, those exceptions was better than 10%. Education and taxation and equities. It's wrong to have an education system where the quality of a child's education is dependent on their zip code. We have wealthy counties in Pennsylvania, especially the ring counties around Philadelphia and those around Allegheny, where there's a lot of commercial business, they generate a lot of property tax revenue. Good example is the Lower Marion School District in Bucks County, or in Montgomery County rather. They spend $28,000 per year per student. You have students in less wealthy, I'll say poorer school districts, who don't generate that kind of revenue. Their taxpayers are tapped out and you're educating students for anywhere from eight to $10,000 a year. Why should a student's education depend on their zip code? Because of the totally broken education finance system we have, but the taxation inequities as well. I don't want to get too deep in the weeds here, but the money from the state to the school districts is currently distributed under a funding formula enacted in 1991. And part of that formula says all school districts will be held harmless. What that means is all school districts will get the same relative amount of funding forever, regardless of changes in student population. You can see where this is headed. Berwick School District, Columbia County, roughly 30% of their school budget comes from local school property taxes. They have lost almost 1,000 students in the past 10 years. They are awash in money from the state because they don't have as many students to educate. You take the flip side of that, York Suburban School District in York County, they've had a large influx of students over the past 10 years. Their budget is financed 88% through local property taxes. Where is the fairness? 30% in one district, 88% in another. So much for uniformity of taxation. And finally, the projected cost of education, which I talked about earlier. But here's the real problem. You don't have to memorize the numbers, but try to keep that chart in mind, because I'm going to refer back to it later in the talk. This is a chart from a study by the Pennsylvania Independent Fiscal Office. I've added the green line, which is the Pennsylvania average weekly wage. But these are their numbers. The, uh, the Independent Fiscal Office did a thorough analysis, in fact, twice, of House Bill and Senate Bill 76. The black line at the top is the increase in school property taxes between 1993 and 2013, a 20-year period. Property taxes that during that time have risen 146%. You notice in the left side of the line, those three lines pretty much were in sync with one another, and then in the early 2000s, the property taxes took off to the moon. The second line, the dotted green, is Pennsylvania's average weekly wage. This is a direct reflection of what Pennsylvanians earn and what they are able to afford. The third line, the dotted red, is the increase in inflation as measured by the Consumer Price Index. 146% increase in school property taxes, an 80% increase in the average weekly wage, and a 59% increase in inflation. And that black line is going to continue 
to widen out further from the average weekly wage. How long can that continue till property taxpayers are no longer going to be able to afford our education system and we're seeing it right now? I'm going to come back to this in a little while. Just try to remember the, the relationship of those three lines. So what are the real problems? Short answer, an irreparably broken K-12 public education finance system. Myth number two, property tax relief or property tax reform is the solution. How many times have you heard about property tax relief? How's the, uh, how's the Act 1 relief from gambling money working out for you? <laughs> now, uh, uh, give me an idea. What kind, of, what kind of rebates are you getting on that? Nothing. Nothing? Nothing? Nothing. Nothing. No. Okay. Geez, I thought we were, we were, thought we were bailed from Berks County at $116. Since 2007, that has not increased in our particular school district. $116 each year since 2007 against, for us, a $4,600 school property tax bill. Thanks a lot. Gets me two tanks of gas. And pretty much gambling revenue has, has topped out in Pennsylvania. We're not going to see much increase beyond this. Sorry, Governor Rendell said he could, he could uh, give us a 33% cut standing on his head. Well, so much for the 33% cut. What's wrong with tax relief? Act 50, Act 72, Act 1, and HB 1600. Act 50, Act 72, and Act 1 were all various flavors of the same idea. Act 50 and Act 72 allowed local school districts to shift part of their property taxes to a local earned income tax at their discretion. Most school districts opted not to do it. Act 1 came around in 2006 with the same proposal, shift from property taxes to an earned income tax. Only at this time, Governor Rendell was pretty sure what was going to happen, so he said, we're going to put it to a statewide referendum. 498 school districts were eligible for the referendum. It was rejected in 494 of the 498 districts. People didn't want a tax shift to another local tax. That's simple. With HB 1600, that was a bill introduced a couple of years ago, and it's, not, it's no longer around, but I use it as an example because it called for an increase of a half a point in the, in the sales tax to 6.5% and an increase in the quarter, of a quarter point in the state income tax. And in return, you would have gotten about a $400 a year property tax rebate. Think about that for a second. How long has it taken you right now to see your property taxes increase? $400. Not long. <coughs> so what's the net result? In a few years, you're right back where you were before with the same property tax bill, only you're paying a half a point extra in sales tax and a quarter point extra in income tax. Unless you cap or end the property tax, shifting to another method of taxation does not work and there is no such thing as relief. I'm going to get a little political here too, so uh, please don't be offended. We are nonpartisan and when I talk about parties, I call it as I see it. House Bill 1189 was introduced this year by Representative Seth Grove of York County. And what it did was once again call for a local tax shift at the discretion of the school boards, only this time he wanted to do it with three different local taxes, and earned income tax, and a mercantile tax, and a gross receipts tax on businesses. But it's the same principle. Shift to something else, property taxes are going to go right back up, with new taxes to pay. This, what's even more onerous about this is that when you shift those costs to business, consider a small businessman. Gross receipts tax is on your gross receipts. Whether or not you made a profit, you pay a tax on it. But then not only are you getting hit on the front end, the front end if you're a businessman, you get hit on the back end too with the earned income tax. Now, if you were a businessman, would you stay in a school district that did that? I don't think so. But it's just, another, it's just another flavor of the same idea, shift to local taxes, that's going to give people relief. Nonsense. It does no such thing. Just like the Act 1 rebates. Mine was eaten up the first year with an increase in property taxes. That $116 went nowhere. Bottom line is relief is quickly outstripped by relentlessly rising school property taxes, and any relief plan is doomed to failure if the system isn't restructured. Those were our three R's. No relief. No reform, no reduction. Replace the school property tax with a better taxation system, drive a stake through the school property tax system, and kill it forever in Pennsylvania. All right.
guy's been sitting there for 30 years. No wonder he looks like that. And politicians tell us that this is a difficult problem that is not easily resolved, that we should study it more. They've been saying the same thing for 30 years, and I'm sorry. This is nothing but a whiny excuse to absolve them from taking effective action on this bill, or on any other measure for that matter. We're tired of hearing the excuses. It's time for action. It's time for the politicians to do what they're paid to do. Ignore the special interests, ignore partisan politics, and do what is right for the people of Pennsylvania.